now on BBC Radio Berkshire, it's Tony Blackburn. Indeed it is. Thank you very much, Sue, for the uh, the news, and uh, welcome along. I've got a terrific show lined up for you today. Uh, we're going to be talking to uh, John Walsh, who's the BAFTA Award-winning filmmaker, uh, coming up very shortly. We've got um, archive footage of hit programmes like Top of the Pops and Doctor Who are at risk of being lost forever because uh, the TV and film industry haven't archived them properly. Some of the films have ended up on skips, in some uh, cases burnt. BAFTA-winning uh, filmmaker uh, John Walsh, um, well, you haven't actually been recruited, so what, everything I'm saying is not actually right, because we thought you spent most of your time restoring films, but you don't actually, do you? No, I spent... Restoring your own. I've been restoring my own film. And, and make and, films. And make films. And in that process, I found out about other people's films ah, and see, other yes. lost recordings. So now I'm making a film about other people's lost films, television and recordings. So you're making a film about the fact they've lost them? I am indeed, I yes. See, yeah. Oh, yes. that's different, isn't it? Yes. It is. Where it, fe it feels like an untapped area because, of course, yeah. everyone knows about the Tony Hancocks, the Doctor Whos, yes. and, of course, the Top of the Pops that are missing. And uh, in recent uh, weeks, mm. Alistair Cook's Letters to America have been found in an old farm somewhere. Um, well, I spoke to the head of Universal Music, David Sharp, and said to him, look, I'd like to have a look in your deep, deep archive and find mm. out what the story is behind keeping tapes and what happens to them and so on. Yeah. And he said, great, John, because, you know, we're missing master tapes from The Who and other big acts. So I got access to his deep archive. Yeah. And uh, I'm now I'm starting to research a project on, on that. So looking for missing sort of pop recordings and music I, recordings. Actually, Top of the Pops, funny enough, because I know about that because I was on the early editions, which they lost. Uh, well, they didn't lose them, but the tapes were so big, the original videotapes, the storage was a problem, wasn't it? That's right. I mean, the BBC mm. often says, with that and Doctor Who, you know, they couldn't store them in West London. It was very expensive, yeah. which, which it, in case it points it was. And, of course, when everything switched to colour in the early 70s, there was a, a big pressure on the BBC not to repeat black and white programmes. Mm. So there was a move to kind of junk, deliberately junk those black and white shows in favour of going colour for the audience because both the black and white and the colour licence fee went up dramatically to pay for colour development. Yeah. So you can kind of see the logic for it. Now, now, I mean, nowadays it's easy, isn't it? Because you can just store things in the cloud and wherever else you store the stuff and you put them on hard drive and they don't take up the space. But I mean, th those original video tapes, I mean, I've, I, I saw all those on. And, uh, I mean, they were enormous, weren't they? The boxes and everything. They were. And, you know, when they used to go to foreign countries, um, yeah. they used to be put on what's called telecordings. So they'd be put on film strips. Mm. So Top of the Pops, Doctor Who, Tony Hancock, sent on film strips, yeah. film reels to other countries. And, you know, that's how they've uncovered some hidden gems. You know, recent Patrick yeah. Troussen episodes, it's because mm. places like Nigeria actually still had those film strips, and they've been transferred now back to right. high definition, which is fantastic. And of course, in those days, when we were making Top of the Pops and uh, various other sort of black and white TV programmes, we didn't realise that Dave was going to come along, <laughs> and uh, Gold, and these these other stations, of course. And it's a, it's a tragedy, isn't it? Because you can't get a lot of these shows back, of course. Exactly. You know, when there was less television channels, when there was just, say, ITV and the BBC, mm. there wouldn't really be room for lots no. of content and repeats, but you're right now, everyone wants to monetize it. Mm. So my film that's coming out next week, Monarch, I shot just 20 years ago, so not not old in any real sense, but even tracking down the film negative for that, a bit like picture negative, you might have your old colour photographs, mm. that's what you need to go back to when you're creating a, a HD remaster, as they call it. So, so the film that you did, which is coming out on DVD, is it, next week? That's right, Monarch. Yes. Uh, who does that star, by the way? Um, it stars T.P. McKenna as Henry VIII, yeah. and Jean Marsh, we might remember from Upstairs, Downstairs, oh, yeah, course, as a yeah. ghostly amalgamation of all of his ex-wives. Mm. And this is coming out on the 7th of April, next, uh, next week, but it was made 20 years ago, so why did it actually need restoring? Well, the interesting thing is, um, the film itself, as I say, was on, was on film. Unlike most yeah. movies today, even big Hollywood blockbusters are shot digitally and they're shot on either tape yeah. or on kind of cards and so on. So this was shot the old-fashioned way. And normally the negative would go into the laboratory. From that, they'd make prints for the cinema. But often then the negative would either be you know, thrown away for space purposes, or because it's gone to maybe a, a videotape, you don't need the original negative anymore. It's only in the last 10 years, HD processes tell us that we have to go back mm. and find the originals. So, of course, film and TV companies are scrambling around saying, where are our originals? Where are our originals? We need to monetize. We need to monetize. When you, when you get a film like yours, though, it wasn't shot, obviously, in HD in those days, was it? Because HD wasn't invented, I don't think. So, so how do you get make it become suddenly HD? Well, that's the, that's the interesting question, isn't it? Because people say, how can you have a HD from an old movie before mm. the invention of HD? Film is a naturally high-definition format in itself. And when they go back and look at old Hollywood films, such as The Wizard of Oz, Gone with the Wind, they're, they're shot on the same 35 mil strip that you might have had in your old stills camera mm. um, from the 70s and 60s. So... Um, 
because of the amount of information that's stored on the film negative, it's only by going back to the negative you can get a full high definition transfer. But it's actually on film though, isn't it? So yes. You can't get anything from that film, can you? Just. I mean, you can. You can. You, actually, you can actually enhance it. You know, film is a different yeah. process to videotape. It's a process called silver halides, which are on the emulsion. So if you were to put film under a microscope and have a look, it's got a lot more information on it in one frame than even one frame of HD videotape would today. So that's the fascinating thing. Oh, you know, see. old films are naturally high definition in, their, in the way they've could, collected the information. Could, could you turn uh, Monarch into 3D as well? You can. You can retrofit films into 3D. Mm. Uh, the Last Emperor, for example, which came out in 1988, that's having its 3D premiere at the BFI this Thursday. So yes, you know, refitting or retrofitting 3D mm. is very popular. Does it look good? It can do. I mean, you know, with, yeah. with all these things, it's a case of how much time and money you spend on them. Mm. Monarch looks particularly good, sharp, and has great sound. I'm just, I'm just trying so. to work out how you can make... Um, uh, a film like that into 3D. It seems practically impossible. Well, what you do is you take the foreground action, so you yeah. imagine the actor in the foreground, and the background, which is a separate element, mm. you, you basically replicate them on a computer. So you separate the two elements, you move them slightly, mm. and you reprocess them with a slight difference to the left and right eye. So you try and pull away, if you like, the actor yeah. from the background. Wow. It's quite a painstaking process. So you don't just make it go fuzzy. <laughs> no. <laughs> not, not all of them have been successful. George Lucas brought out one of the Star Wars films in 3D. <laughs> <laughs> that looked pretty good. There's a bit more music and we'll talk, talk again in a moment, shall we, yeah, right now? Uh, there, is... and uh, my special guest is uh, John Walsh, who's a film producer, oh, BAFTA yeah. Award winner as well. Uh, Thank you. What did you. What did you get the BAFTA Award for? Uh, um, it was twice. Once for a, a film called Karate Kids, which was about disabled children learning martial yes. arts, and previous to that for my Channel 4 series Don't Make Me Angry, which was TV's first anger management series. Oh, I see, yes. So you, you do tend to do documentaries about uh, people who've got problems, is that right? Yeah, sort of social mobility and social justice. Yeah. Um, I made a documentary about about um, the last general election. I stood as a candidate in 2010, mm. made a film about that process. And you obviously was, didn't win because you're here. No, I'm not. I would have been a shirt and tie <laughs> if I'd won. Um, but uh, no, I didn't win, but um, that was interesting, and that was in cinemas yeah. in 2000. So were you, did you go in to become, try to become a... Um uh, in, in, in the House of Parliament, a politician for the documentary or not? Or were you serious? You wanted to become a... No, it's, it's a serious attempt to become a candidate. And, yeah. uh, and, Are you going to do it again? I've been asked to do it again for next year, so I'm very flattered. So I, I might I might very well take them up on that. Yeah. I haven't quite decided so yet. So you'd rather do that than uh, filmmaking? Well, this is, this is where the conflict is. So I mm. would probably have to give all that up if I became a public servant, which would be I suppose a shame. You would. Yes. Yeah. Mind you, it's lovely. You've obviously been to the House of Commons and seen it all. Yes, I have a few times. It's a nice lovely. place to live for five years. Isn't it's it? fabulous, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Excellent stuff. Going back to the films and uh, the, the cinema and everything like that, I notice now that um, you know you, you you get a film into the cinema and then it's not long, about two months now, until it goes to DVD or on Sky or Netflix or what have you. Um, do you think it's a good thing? I think it is, you know, because mm. you know, more money that comes into the industry quicker, it, it's kind of, it, it st stymies the flow of piracy as well. Because if mm. you think a few years ago, if it was going to be six months or a year before it goes on to, say, VHS or DVD, then in that window, often um, people will come in with piracy copies. Yes. You buy, possibly down the market, if dodgy VHS or DVD. With somebody's so, head in the, you know, somebody, somebody taking a camera into the cinema or something like that. Absolutely. Dreadful. Yeah. Uh, do you, I mean, do you see a time, I mean, I, I would like to see some of the new releases on a, on a film channel that's just for new releases as well, but I suppose people would say, well, it would kill the cinema off a little bit, would it or not? I don't know. It possibly would. You know, there has mm. been date-on-date -date releases for smaller budget yes. films, yeah. um, but I think for the big Hollywood blockbusters, they need that opening weekend, they need people to kind of queue up with the popcorn and the colas, mm. and sort of word of mouth. You know, if you think of the big hits that are coming along with the big movies like Noah, which is out this week, you know, that really yeah, needs that. Yeah, I'm that, actually. Yeah, and that really needs that kind of group experience, doesn't mm. it? What do you think, um... Uh, Mark Kermode, Com you know, who's, uh, who's the film critic, I've had an ongoing argument with him for a long time about 3D. And I saw him the other day, and he said, all oh, 3D's going to die out. That was about a year ago. And, and uh, I saw him the other day, and I said, I was right, wasn't I? And he said, he said yeah, he said, um, he said, you know, some of the films are actually really good. I mean, do you like, do you a, th a 3D fan or not? I am, you know, I've, I've thought about making television programs in 3D, and I've looked at some of the technology. Yeah. And if you look at a film like Disney's Frozen, you know, that was a very successful film. Now the most successful animated film of all time mm. and a big part of the success of that film is it's wonderful 3d you know so people there are some critics who don't like it and find it difficult with the glasses yeah but overall you know the industry will say thumbs up you know 3d is as long as it's making money will will keep it around i think a lot of uh, people are looking forward to when we don't have to wear glasses for 3d which i, I gather has been invented isn't it i, I think it's, i think it's on the way at any rate. It is, yeah, yeah. Holographic uh, projection is what it's called. Yeah. Whereby you don't have to sort of separate your left and right eye, the kind of the projection system.
system does it for you. So mm. exciting times ahead. So exciting times ahead. And um, what's ahead for you? And um, well, the release of Monarch. You know, I've been speaking to people yes. about the film. Sadly, T. P. McKenna, who played our Henry VIII, died a couple of years ago, and uh, Jean Marsh. Who, who was in Upstairs Downstairs, we remember. Yeah. She came back to help me with the restoration, and she's been involved in, in the making of the project. So we've got documentaries on the DVD to mm. explain why it was lost, how we found it, what else we found along the way. And uh, I'm basically just trying to make sure that the film gets seen by as many people as possible. So this is the final copy, which you've uh, very kind of given me here, um, Monarch Henry VIII. Uh, and this is the high definition quality of it. So what, what, what did the other one look like then when you, when you got it? It was just uh, not, not as sharp? No, it wouldn't be as sharp. If we, if we took it from a projection print that was used in the cinema, then it would look quite soft by comparison, almost a little bit out of focus. Mm -hmm. What this does by going back to the negative, it makes it really, really pin sharp. And, and we've been getting great feedback from people who've seen it, who've seen advanced copies. And interesting, a lot of people that buy Downton Abbey box sets have been kind of swarming to this because of the Jean Marsh upstairs downstairs connection. So, you know. Although she wasn't in Downton Abbey. Was she it? wasn't in Downton Abbey, but no. she was in the, if you like, the original <laughs> Downton, Downton, Downton. Yes, that's which right. Was yeah. Upstairs, downstairs, everyone I think agrees that, that inspired, <laughs> you know, Julian Fellows. Yes, absolutely, yeah. Excellent stuff. So it's in the, uh, and is this uh, available on Prime Time or any of the Netflix or anything like that? Yeah, it's what? available as a download service. It's going to yeah. be available eventually on iTunes. It will be currently available next week on Amazon Prime, which is a rental and download service. Yes, that's right, Star yeah. Trek-ish. And of course mm. you can buy the old-fashioned, which I prefer, the old-fashioned, you know, DVD and have it in your hand. Excellent stuff. Well, John, thanks very much indeed. And what, what, what are you currently working on at the moment? I'm working on a couple of new projects. Projects, interestingly, a feature film documentary project looking at the, the deep archive of Universal Music. Yeah. Of course, Universal owns Island Records, EMI, Virgin, and Decca. And I had access to their deep archive there a couple of weeks ago, spoke to the archivist, and he told me some astonishing stories of programs that are missing, mm. master tapes from The Who that are missing, things they recently found, such as the Queen, Queen's first appearance on Top of the Pops uh, via a tape of Dick Emery's from his own private collection. Yeah. And so just generally that, looking into all those format issues of old music recordings. Excellent stuff. It must be fascinating. Uh, John, John Walsh, a BAFTA award winner and filmmaker, thank you for coming to see us today here at BBC Radio Berkshire.